In 2012, a fisherman wakes up to the familiar feeling of four walls pressing against him. Everywhere is dark except for the little rays of light sneaking into the cooler he's been hiding in for 320 days. He hasn't seen or talked to another living soul for that long, and it's been even longer since he's set foot on dry land. Every day this fisherman curls up inside that cooler, trying to stay alive. But one day he leaves the cooler to check if his water jugs caught any rain. He pushes open the cooler's lid and all he sees is water as soon as he steps out. Just water everywhere and not a drop for him to drink. His water jugs are empty so that makes it another day of drinking his own pee. He turns around in frustration, ready to crawl back into the cooler when something on the horizon catches his eye. It's moving, and it's not just a wave. What could that possibly be? So, in 2002, this fisherman, Jose Alvarenga, leaves for Mexico to work as a fisherman under Vilino Rodriguez. He does this for a while, then in 2012, he decides to go on a deep-sea fishing trip. Jose plans to spend 30 hours out in the Pacific Ocean and with the chance of catching marlin, sharks, or sailfish. He knows it will be worth it. The money he could make from this trip would cover him for the week. But there's a problem. Jose's regular fishing partner suddenly can't come, and because he doesn't want to miss out on this opportunity of making more money, Jose finds Ezekiel, a 23-year-old newbie who barely knows how to fish. What could go wrong, Jose must have thought. So the two set off in their boat, a 23-foot fiberglass skiff with a motor and a big cooler for their catch. Their boat is not exactly the best. It has no sails, no oars, and they didn't even pack an anchor. They have enough gas and water, a half-charged two-way radio, and a GPS that isn't even waterproof. No maps or flare guns. All they have is just confidence and a bit of luck. Things start off great. They harvest about 500 kilos of fresh fish, and it's looking like a good day until around 1 a.m. when huge waves crash into their boat. Rain starts falling, and it becomes so heavy that it begins to fill up the boat. And guess what? Back on shore, harbor masters already banned anyone from going out to sea because of the fierce storm. But because these two men are unaware, they decide to head back. They're bailing water, crying for help, battling the waves and praying the skiff doesn't flip. It's freezing cold, and these men are fighting with all their strength, trying to get to Costa Al. Jose holds on to the tiller. He seems pretty calm since he has been in several situations like this before, but not Ezekiel. He isn't a fisherman, but just a kid from the village's soccer team who agreed to come along for 50 bucks. The crazy part is he and Jose don't even know each other. The storm gets intense with each minute that passes. Ezekiel, cold and freezing, stops bailing water. All he does is scream and hold on to the boat for his dear life. At exactly 9 a.m., the clouds open up for a moment and they see land some miles away. Thinking this will all be over soon, relief washes over them. But then, suddenly, the boat makes some funny noises and dies. And no matter how hard they try, the engine doesn't start on its own. They even make a mistake of breaking the cord while trying to pull the engine. Jose tries to call his boss, Vino Rodriguez, for help, but he can't because there is no GPS or map. And just when things couldn't get worse, the radio battery dies. They try other solutions to make the boat lighter. They throw their 500-pound catch, gas, and most of their gear overboard. Jose even ties some buoys to the boat to slow it down. But without an anchor, the boat keeps drifting further out into the ocean. And so, they watch in shock as the mountains on shore get smaller until it's no longer in sight. For five days, the storm pushes them farther from land. Jose, unable to hide his frustration, smashes the broken engine with a club and throws their useless gadgets into the ocean. They finally turn a cooler upside down, enter into it, 
and take turns bailing water every 10 to 15 minutes. And after what seems like forever, the storm finally stops. But they are lost and can't find their way home. Jose and Ezekiel are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with no land in sight. There is nothing but the endless blue water stretching far beyond the horizon. Even with a working motor, most of their fishing gear is lost or broken in the storm. Now, they have only the shirts on their backs and a little bit of food. It gets clearer that they are alone, and all they have is themselves. One would think that since Jose is able to call his boss back on shore, a search party would be sent out. Right? But searching for a small boat in the Pacific Ocean, that's like trying to find a tiny speck in a giant room. The Pacific Ocean is huge, it covers more than 165 million square kilometers, and it is big enough for all the land on Earth to fit inside with room to spare. It even has the most isolated spot on Earth, Point Nemo, which is 1,670 miles from any land. This is the kind of place you don't want to get lost in. Actually, Jose's boss does send a rescue team when he gets their call for help. But after two days of searching with no luck, they give up. By then, the two men have drifted hundreds of miles away, carried by the ocean like a leaf in the wind. And every day out there is worse than the last. Their boat has no roof, so the hot sun shines down on them like a spotlight, making them burn like hot dogs on a grill. And when night comes, the cold wind blows around them like a chilly ghost. The only place they can fit for shelter is the cooler they use to keep fish. But that one also smells so bad. Now, with their food almost gone, they start to think of other alternatives before they turn into human skeletons. In that stinky cooler, these two men come up with the craziest plans on how to survive. Jose kneels over the side of the boat, his arms buried in water up to his shoulders, and he waits. When a fish finally swims between them, he snaps his hands together around the fish with lightning speed, digging his fingernails into its slippery scales. Ezekiel cuts up the fish for them to eat or dry. On other days, Jose even catches a seabird or a turtle that wanders too close. The tricky part is they don't have a stove or fire to cook on. So, they either eat their catch raw or dried, risking all sorts of nasty stuff like salmonella. They even eat jellyfish, despite the painful stings. Sometimes, Jose gets so hungry that he starts to nibble on his own overgrown fingernails. He does this imagining he's eating one of his favorite dishes. But finding water? That's a bigger problem. You might think, since they have a whole ocean around them, it shouldn't be a problem. But drinking salt water is a big no-no. What it does is that it makes them thirstier and dehydrates them even faster. To get fresh water, they have to rely on rain and collect it in plastic bottles they find floating around. But then, rain doesn't always come when they need it. In fact, during the first nine days after the storm, not a single drop from the sky. Since rain isn't an option, they are forced to turn to Plan B, which is even worse, drinking turtle blood. Yup, you heard right. Whenever Jose catches a turtle, they flip it on its back, cut its throat, and collect the red liquid in a bottle. That warm, thick liquid, although it tastes salty and smells awful, is a perfect example of their desperate times calling for desperate measures. And if they can't catch a turtle, they go for Plan C. This is where urine comes into play. Jose is the first to try it, taking a tiny sip. He gags at the salty, bitter taste, but to his surprise, it's not as bad as he expects. Pee, drink, pee, drink, and it becomes a weird cycle. Sadly, it just makes them more dehydrated, but they're trying to stay sane after all. And so the two men survive, hoping for rescue as they drift, gulping down whatever they can find to keep themselves alive. Some days, Jose and Ezekiel would sit together, talking about their personal lives. They would speak about their parents, regrets, and dreams. Jose has a daughter who he frequently thinks of, while Ezekiel talks about his mother. 
Both men admit how badly they've behaved toward their parents, imagining hugging and kissing them. Sometimes they pray and ask God for forgiveness. Weeks turn into months, and they settle into a routine that keeps their spirits up. But things take a turn four months in, when Ezekiel falls sick from after raw seabird meat. His mouth foams, his stomach cramps in agony, and he spits out the fresh rainwater Jose tries to give him. Jose doesn't know what to do, so cuts the bird Ezekiel ate, and surprisingly finds the remains of a yellow-bellied sea snake in the bird. Did the venom get into Ezekiel's body? Is it fatal? They try to remember what they've heard about these snakes from other fishermen, and it's not looking good. Luckily, within two days, Ezekiel recovers. But the shock makes him refuse to eat any bird meat Jose offers, no matter how much he pleads. Ezekiel is done with seabird meals for good. Unfortunately, the trauma of the seabird incident, combined with the depression of being lost at sea, begins to break Ezekiel's spirit. He refuses all food, and his strength fades fast. His arms slowly turn into twigs, and his legs are barely thicker than a forearm. With Ezekiel's condition worsening, the two men agree that if one of them dies, the other will visit the deceased's family. Ezekiel also makes Jose promise not to eat him if he passes. Jose agrees, but still begs Ezekiel not to give up. On their 118th day at sea, Jose tries to give Ezekiel some water, but suddenly Ezekiel's body can't take it. Violent convulsions shake him as Jose desperately tries to pass the water to his lips. Moments later, Ezekiel goes limp, and before Jose could do anything, he's gone. Now, Jose is left to face the reality of being alone. Surviving is already a huge challenge, but now Jose has to deal with the mental toll of being all by himself, and that's even harder than anyone can think. But something strange happens afterwards. Jose starts to talk to Ezekiel's lifeless body as if his friend is still alive, confessing secrets, asking how he slept, and even sharing his frustrations. Six nights later, under a bright moon, Jose suddenly realizes the crazy truth. He's been chatting with a rotting corpse. That's when it hits him that his friend isn't coming back, and talking to him is probably a sign he's starting to lose it. Though eating Ezekiel might help him survive, Jose wants to honor their agreement and let his friend rest in peace, so he gives him a burial at sea. Maybe you think cannibalism is absurd, but it's something that happened in desperate situations before, like in 1972, where survivors of a plane crash in the Andes Mountains are forced to eat their frozen friends just to stay alive. Jose, however, sticks with his beliefs, so he presses on, imagining a new reality each day. He pictures himself waking up in his bed or walking in the park instead of being stuck on the boat. He even pretends that the raw fish he eats is a gourmet meal. Most importantly, he thinks of his family, especially his daughter, and promises himself that if he survives, he'll make things right with them. The days drag on, with Jose exhausted, sunburned, and taking shelter in a cooler at night. He sees ships on the horizon, but they're too far away to even signal at them. Once he thinks a ship is close enough, he would wave and yell, only to realize it's far. The ship's crew can't hear Jose, and his tiny boat is too low in the ocean to be seen. Starvation, thirst, and being all alone have become his new normal. He gets so used to seeing things that aren't real that he starts to wonder if he's losing his mind. But on day 438, something different happens. Jose wakes up and notices coconut husks floating by his boat and seagulls flying close to the water. Then, out on the horizon, he sees it, an island. At first, he thinks it's just another trick his mind is playing, but this island doesn't disappear like the others. It stays in his vision. And the best part, his boat is drifting right toward it. Jose knows this is his last shot at being saved. He has to make sure his boat keeps moving. Grabbing his knife, he cuts off the buoys that are slowing him down. So without them, the skiff speeds up, zooming toward the island. After half a day, he's just 
10 yards from the shore. Without a second thought, Jose jumps into the water, leaving behind the boat that's been his home for over a year, and swims for the beach. He crawls onto the sand, feeling overwhelmed with joy. Jose is finally on dry land. But then a chilling thought hits him. What if this island is deserted? What if he's stuck here forever? As he thinks of that, he spots two people near a tiny beach house. Humans. With all the strength he has left, Jose jumps, shouts, waving at them. The locals, Emmy and Russell, are drying coconuts when they see this wild-looking skinny man waving a knife and shouting in Spanish. Naturally, they're terrified. But soon they realize he's not a threat, but just a starving, desperate castaway. They invite him into their home and give him his first proper meal in over a year. It's January 30th, 2014, and after 438 days lost at sea, Jose Alvarenga is finally saved. What he doesn't know yet is that he's landed on a tiny island in the Marshall Islands, one of the most remote places on Earth. If he had missed it, the next stop would have been the Philippines, more than 3,100 miles away. Jose is then taken to a hospital in the Marshall Islands for treatment. He has lost a lot of weight because he hasn't had enough food or water. He looks so weak that he can barely walk, his ankles are swollen and his blood pressure is super low. Plus, he has developed hydrophobia, known as an intense fear of water. But surprisingly, his vital signs are mostly fine. Too fine, if you ask. After 11 days in the hospital, he gets better and is finally sent home, where his family, especially his daughter, is excited to see him alive. But this isn't the end yet, because he now has to prove to everyone that his unbelievable story is true. I mean, a man surviving more than a year alone in the ocean, with just a boat and an empty fish cooler. Who would believe that? It doesn't sound possible. People even question how he doesn't have scurvy without eating fruits or veggies. But scientists say fish, birds, and turtle meat might give him enough vitamin C. To confirm Jose's story, officials track down his boss, who confirms that the boat Jose washes up in is the same one that left port in 2012 and vanished. Rescue officials also back up the story, remembering that they searched for the missing boat, but called it off after bad weather set in. Even oceanographers create a model of how far his boat drifts, based on wind and currents. And guess what? It matches up perfectly. Jose even passes a polygraph test, proving his story is true. The press finally publishes his tale, and he holds the record for surviving the longest on sea. But there's one last twist. Ezekiel's family accuses Jose of cannibalism and sues him for a million dollars. Luckily, Jose's lawyer defends him, and the case is dismissed. 